will be accomplished. His cause will be vindicated. His people, his people will be purified. His grace will be bestowed and his son will be glorified. Now you can't live a Christian life without a doctrinal foundation and live it with joy and love as with the act of, as, as an act of the Lord. What does the future hold? The doctrine of eschatology. As we witness the turmoil throughout our world and see the ever-increasing rise of ecumenism, it is easy for us to imagine how the one world church might be established and how the leader known as Antichrist might establish his reign. While it is fascinating and even frightening to consider how the one world philosophy of our government is growing in compatibility with the end time picture, let us not become enamored or infatuated with this world in progressing towards the end. The tribulation period is not about the accomplishment of the one world church or the kingdom of the Antichrist. Both of them will enjoy a very short rise and we utterly have complete demise. The Antichrist will reign in the second half of the tribulation, but it is not his day. It is the day of Jacob's trouble. It is a time in which God's purpose will be accomplished. His cause will be vindicated. His people will be purified and his grace will be bestowed as his son is glorified. While history often extols the accomplishments of men, history has not been told until it identifies the purpose that God accomplishes therein. As we study these end time events, we are confronted with the simple but profound nature of God's sovereignty over his creation. We do not serve a God whose purpose can fail. We do not serve a God whose plan can be overcome by the power of darkness. We do not serve a God who is subject to the whims of his creation. We serve a God who accomplishes all of his pleasure. And Isaiah, it says, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times of things which are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Or in another version, it says, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. This lesson will set forth our focus on the tribulation period and move from its description to its purpose. So first period of the tribulation, the period is described. The term used to describe the tribulation, the period is described as a tribulation in Matthew 24, 21, in Matthew 24, 29, it says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as not from since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor even ever shall be. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the power of heaven shall be shaken. Revelation 7, 14 says, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said, These are them which came out, of the tri great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So throughout the new Testament, the term tribulation, philipsis means trouble, affliction. And in our study of eschatology, the study of last things, the word eschat meaning last and theology would be the study of the last things. In other words, tribulation refers to a future period when God will pour out his righteous judgment on the earth the coming period of tribulation will be unlike any other period on the earth the true nature of god's wrath against sin will begin to be witnessed during this period the intensity of the spiritual warfare in which be believers will live will be readily apparent to all who believe during the great tribulation we just had to make a little technical adjustment there this period is described in an hour of testing. So it's described, first of all, as a tribulation. Yes, we'll have question and answer at the end. The uh, period is described also as an hour of testing. As we look in Revelation 3.10, it says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patient, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation. Not slow, these men, English is their second language. Which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Uh, Dr. Jim just reminded me to talk slowly because uh, in uh, United States terms, I'm considered a Yankee because I'm from the North. In the North, they talk much faster. There's, not, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just that's how they do. But in the South, they talk much slower. 
So I thought of that this morning when I was praying at three in the morning that I would talk slower. So now I will keep my word that I told the Lord I will, I will speak slower now. The church age, believers have the promise of God to be kept from this hour of testing, which will come to them that dwell upon the earth. The phrase, them that dwell upon the earth, is used consistently throughout the book of Revelation in reference to the unsaved, the unredeemed humanity. So it's not talking about us. I know you'd be worried so far about talking about the tribulation, but it's not talking about us. It's talking about the unsaved, the unredeemed humanity primarily. Because of God's long suffering, unredeemed mankind concludes that God will not judge or that God will not know what they are doing. It says that in Psalm 7, 3 and Psalm 9, 11. They believe that the lie of Satan, that sin will not be bring about. However, during the tribulation period, God's displeasure with sin will be experienced in judgment. Yet they will not repent, but they will be angry with God and they will blaspheme God for his judgment. Revelation 11, 8 and Revelation 16, 9. Now, what will be our application so far? Do you meet the conditions from being kept from this hour? Note the description of the true believer in this text. True believers keep God's word and persevere in the faith. Now, I'm in America where there's not much persevering seemingly compared to China or North Korea or Iraq or throughout the world. We, we have it very easy here, and yet we still do not preach. There's probably only 15% of the population that be willing to preach one-on-one -on -one witnessing to someone about their salvation. So very few. And maybe out of that few, that 15% that might be willing to give the gospel about the last things, the gospel about Christ coming, the gospel about Christ coming and witness against sin, there'd be maybe only 1% that do it on a regular basis. So I'm ashamed to say that, but I must give you the reality of the context of where I'm coming from that we preach this and we teach this and we believe this, but we don't see it in our country like it should be. So we're no example in this area is only 15% perhaps witnessing and only 1% witnessing on a regular basis about the fact that God will judge sin. Perhaps you have bought the Satan's deception that God will not judge sin or that you are good enough to stand in the day of judgment, but God has given us this hour of testing, and it's going to come upon all the world and with the outpouring of almighty God's wrath on unbelief. God is holy and hates sin with every ounce of his being. If you are part of those who dwell upon the earth, you will not stand in the day of God's testing. You will fail the test. So the period was a period described as tribulation. Second of all, it's a period that is called the hour of testing. And third, it is called the time of distress or trouble, like Jacob's trouble. In Jeremiah 30, verse 7, alas, for that day is great, so there is none like it, but he shall be saved out of it. And then Jer and Dan Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. There shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even at the same time. And at the time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So who will be delivered? Only those that are written in the book. The unbelievers, the unsaved, the ones that blaspheme God, the ones that hate God for his judgments will not enter into the kingdom, obviously. This description of the tribulation has particular application to the nation of Israel, as you saw that in the Old Testament passage that I alluded to just now. This period is great trouble, which will come upon Israel in the second half of the tribulation. Having raptured, raptured the church before this tribulation starts, and now he's going to deal with sin upon the earth. God will turn his favor back towards the nation of Israel in the second half of the tribulation. It will be again by the unleashing of judgment for her continued rebellion and unbelief. If we go to Israel today, we'll see much rebellion and unbelief. So this period is described as also indignation. Isaiah 26, 20. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chamber, and shut thy doors about thee, and hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be passed. Isaiah 26, 20. And then back to Daniel chapter 8, verse 19. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, and at the time appointed where the end shall be. Then now let's go to the New Testament, 
First Thessalonians 1.10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus delivered us from the wrath to come. So our blessed hope and our glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ wells us up with thanksgiving that even though we study these things, and these things are grave things, these things are sober things, we will not be going through these things. That doesn't make us not want to study it, but makes us study it so that we will be more compelled to give the truth of the God. It is a great day of God's wrath, and no unredeemed people, no unredeemed person will be able to stand. So again, what is our application thus far? The world has developed its own picture of God in its own image and desires. It declares that God is a God of love, and he is. However, the world's God of love will not judge sin because he is so loved. The world declares it. However, the world is world's God of mercy overlooks sin and does not demand justice. The God of this world is responsible to the needs of men and takes pleasure in them. The God of the Bible, however, is holy, just, and reigns in absolute righteousness. The God of the Bible delights in himself and takes pleasure in his son and his works of righteousness. He commands men to worship him and take pleasure in his son and in his works. All who rejects his son will be destroyed in hell. The God of the world is not to be furled. The God of the world is not to be feared. And he too is benevolent and kind to judge. However, the God of the Bible has declared that he will take vengeance upon all who reject his word. Therefore, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of judgment. Matthew 10, 28 says, and fear not them that kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. And then again, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30 and 31, for we know him that said, vengeance belongeth unto me, I will yet recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So we had the period described. Now let's have the period identified. It'll be more uh, uh, happy and joyful words as we talk about the rapture of the church. The time of tribulation, it follows the rapture of the church. So let's look at the rapture of the church for a moment. First Thessalonians 1.10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Let me stop for a moment because we were, we've gone for a little bit. Is there any questions so far about the lesson? Uh, let's continue then. And we said in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5.9, for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Revelation 3.10, which we may be familiar with, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. These verses are the Lord's promise to believers who wait for the sun from heaven to those who persevere from the faith. What is the promise? That we will be kept from the wrath of God. This wrath is not the present judicial wrath of God on unbelief, the eternal hellfire that awaits the unbeliever. By context, the purpose of writing this wrath should be identified with the end times wrath poured out by God on earth during the tribulation period. One of Paul's purpose in writing 1 Thessalonians was to clear up standing concerning the participation of the dead brothers with the rapture. 
So Paul's point is simple and profound. Believers have not have been delivered from the wrath which God will pour out on the unredeemed during the tribulation period. Church age believers will be gathered together to be prior to the seven year tribulation period, which will be unprecedented outpouring of the wrath of God on the face of the earth. So the rapture precedes the tribulation. Also, the, the tribulation precedes the millennium. The, the tribulation precedes the millennium. Matthew 24, verse 29 to 31. Let me get this earpiece. Matthew 24, verse 29 to 31. Immediately after the tribulation, see it says immediately after the tribulation, of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the power of heaven shall, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect so the four winds, north and south and east and west, from one end of heaven to the other. So he'll include me, he'll include you. And he'll gather us together in the rapture. In the Greek, it's rapturo, means uh, caught up, to be caught up. The sequence in the Olivet Discourse demands that the tribulation period take place prior to the second coming of Christ and the establishment of his earthly kingdom. Now let's transition to the purpose clarified by saying this. From the description given of this period, it is clear that the tribulation period will be a time of unprecedented judgment upon the earth. There has never been or ever will be a time like this again. While we have examined much of what is going to happen during the dramatic period, in human history, we must now turn our attention to the purpose of this period. We serve a sovereign God who is in complete control of the universe. Amen. As believers, we need to see what God is going to accomplish through this period of judgment. So what's the purpose? Recording. We need to understand how this period fits within God's eternal plan and for his creation and how it accomplishes the spread of his glory across the face of the earth. Let's look at Psalm 72, 18 and 19 together. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doth wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. So the purpose claimed, and now the purpose clarified. The target of the purpose, target purposes of the tribulation. First of all, we'll see God's judgment of confirmed sinfulness. Then we'll see God's chastening of the people of Israel. So we'll look at, look at Israel second. And then last of all, God's grace upon the salvation of Israel and of the nations. So everybody with me? Okay. God's judgment of confirmed sinfulness. Matthew 13, verse 29 and 30. But he said, nay, lest while we gather up the tares, you root also the wheat with them. Let both go together until the harvest. In the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye first the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. And then Revelation 14, 14 and 15. Revelation 14, 14 and 15. And I look and behold a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like the son of man, having in his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out, that's Revelation 14, 14, and 15, crying with a loud voice to him that sat in the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And then verse 18 of that same passage, and another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, thrust in thy sickle, thy sharp sickle, signs of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So when that time comes, it's going to be the perfect time, because he says the grapes are fully ripe. You guys know about those things, about seeing grapes that are fully ripe. I don't know. I live in a very big city, city of a half million to a million people. 
may, maybe a few of my neighbors have some grapes, but I, I didn't get close enough to see what they look like. But you know when they're fully ripe, the time has come for them to be picked. So any crop, whether it be tomatoes or whether it be beets or whether it be squash or whether it be corn, at a certain time, it's time to pick. And uh, in God's program, as sovereign Lord of the earth, there's going to be a certain time when all of the Gentiles will be coming in, that it's going to be coming in, and then it will be time for his wrath. Today, the tares of professing believers and the weak, true believers, grow together throughout the earth and even in the church. There is, however, a coming day when the harvest will be ready and God's judgment executed. Then God will gather all the tares, all the unbelievers, together, and they will be cast into eternal fire of hell. But the wheat, the believers, will be gathered into eternal joy of God's unending kingdom. So we have that eternal joy, not just that joy that we have right now, that seems temporal, though it's eternal. That joy that comes from the Holy Spirit is eternal joy. And we'll get to experience that eternal joy in that day. We'll know what it looks like. We'll know what it feels like. We'll know what it's that people can taste it and see it, that the Lord is good. Revelation 12, verse 1 to 14 and 20 tells us, is in, it's the third interlude of the book of Revelation. It says, between John's revelation concerning the seventh trumpet judgment and the seven bowl judgments, the judgment of God will come on those who worship the Antichrist. That goes all the way, especially through chapter 14, verse 10. The Lord himself is pictured seated in the clouds with a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel entreats the Lord to act, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. The harvest referred to in Revelation chapter 14, verse 18 to 20, is the destruction of the armies of unbelief in the battle of Armageddon. So I know I'm just touching very briefly on this, but we'll look at more detail in future days. Those harvests will be called the great wine press of the wrath of God. The blood will flow as high as the horse's bridle across an entire 200 mile, 200 mile wide battlefield. So what is that, 400 kilometers? About 400 kilometers would be the battlefield full of blood. The incorrigible nature of unsaved men is clearly seen throughout the tribulation period. Men are not good in getting better. Apart from the grace of God, men are slaves to sin and destitute of righteousness. Even in the face of unrelenting wrath of God against sin, men will not repent and turn from their wicked works. It says, he that is wicked will be wicked still in the scriptures. They will continue in their murders, their sorceries, their fornication, and their theft. They will love sin and blaspheme God for his just judgment on their sin. Revelation 9, 20 and 21 tells us this. Revelation 11, 18, and Revelation 16, 9 to 11. First of all, Revelation 9, Verse 20 and 21. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So no repentance, even though God's coming in such great wrath. And then Revelation eleven eighteen, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come, and the time of the dead, and they should be judged, and that they should be given reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them that destroy the earth. And then last of all, Revelation 16, 9 to 11, and the men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God. And which hath power over the place, they repented not to give him glory. So we're looking again and again and again that they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out the vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. So the nations of for his judgment and refuse to give him the glory due to his name. However, the almighty God who created this universe with a spoken word is not subject to his creation, for he is sovereign. When his long suffering is finished and the harvest 
of sin is fully ripened, God will reap. His cause will be vindicated and his son will be glorified as the unredeemed receive their just condemnation for their sin. God has manifested his love and made provision for his salvation for all men in sending of his son. The scripture makes it clear that God has no pleasure in the eternal punishment and eternal suffering of men for sin. As the Lord declares in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 18, 23, in Ezekiel 30, so Ezekiel 18, 23, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. 18.23 and Ezekiel 33.11, it's so important that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Men will perish because they reject God's provision. They reject God's son in whom he most delights. Obviously, God most delights in the son who came, died for us, and rose again. God will not be mocked. He will not share his glory with anyone. God accomplishes all his pleasure, which includes the destruction of unbelief, and the vindication of his son in human history. And God will not be mocked. It says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. And soweth, that shall he reap. For he that soweth of his flesh shall reap corruption. But he that soweth of the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So God's chastening of the world. Now, second of all, God's chastening of Israel. Isaiah 28, 15, because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell, are we at agreement? When the off scourging comes and passes through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. So Israel thinks they could hide from God, but what's it say in Psalm 139? Can anybody hide from God? Can they go to the sea and hide from God? Can they go to the darkness to hide from God? Can they go to the uttermost part of the earth and hide from God? No, there's nowhere, obviously, that we can hide from God. John 5, John 5, 43. John 5, 43 in the New Testament. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you shall receive. So the people, the lost people of the world, the unsaved people of the world, the unbelievers of the world won't receive Christ. Even if all the wrath is shown upon the earth, all the wrath is thrown upon the earth, they still will not receive Christ. They still will sin. They still will be an evil. They still will be full of calamity. But God will have to judge his, the sin of mankind. And so it says in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it, even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. So Israel will be saved out of it, the remnant of Israel. Daniel 12, verse 1, and at that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. There should be a time of trouble, such as never since there was a nation, even the same time, the time thy people, excuse me, shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So this tribulation period will begin with Israel signing a treaty with the Antichrist. Antichrist is the one who comes in his own name, that Israel receives as the Lord declared in John 5 and verse 43. This treaty is called by Isaiah a covenant with death. During the first half of the tribulation, Israel will be allowed to reinstate the temple sacrifices and experience relatively a peaceful time under the protection of the revived Roman Empire. However, the midpoint of the tribulation will radically change all of that. So at the midpoint of that seven-year tribulation, there'll be much change going on very rapidly. This last half of the tribulation is called the time of Jacob's trouble. It will be a specific, special time of God's judgment chasing on Israel for her centuries of unbelief, and especially for her treaty with the Antichrist. It was one thing that Israel didn't believe all these centuries, but now making a covenant with the Antichrist. Not making a covenant with Christ, but with Antichrist. God is not finished with Israel. All of the covenant promises will be fulfilled. Israel as a nation will once again be God's people. 
A cursory review of Israel's history demonstrates how many times God has to bring chastisement upon his people to turn their hearts back to him. The persecution during this period will be greater than anything before in Israel's history. So Israel will perish under the chastising hand of God. So two-thirds, 67% of Israel will be destroyed under God's chastening hand. So what's the application for such a strong thing like this? Well, let's look first at Zechariah 13, 8. It shall come to pass that in that all of Israel, all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but a third shall be left therein. So that's right from Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 8. Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 8. So our application today, God takes sin very seriously. He does not dismiss sin in our lives or in the lives of his people. Peter takes his truth and makes a direct application to professing church age believers as he writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, from verse 15 to 17. Let's look especially at verse 17. And it shall be, and if you call on the Father without respect of persons, judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. The soft tenor of American evangelical Christianity has stripped the church of her holy fear of sin. Sin is sickness. Sin is alternative lifestyle. Sin is chemical imbalance. Sin is genetic. Sin is something to be dealt with through some 12-step program. No. But sin is to not be feared, they would say. No. The evangelical church has become a church that has learned to cope with its dependency and its codependencies and has forgotten how to confront sin. But God has said to his people, Leviticus 27, Leviticus 20 and verse 7, also in 1 Peter chapter 1, the same thought. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I, the Lord, am your God. So God expects us to be holy in this day. Whatever day we live in, this day that we live in, this day of calamity, this day of trouble, not of Jacob's trouble, but of calamity and trouble, we persevere by God's grace, and we believe by God's grace, and we continue in grace and faith by God's grace. May we learn. Can't hear you, sir. Uh, brother, have I have I cut off? Yes. Um, brother John, did I make a mistake? Recording in process. For God's, God's grace, grace in the of Israel. Romans eleven twenty. It's echoing back to me. Okay. Yeah, so just you don't have Brother Jim right here. Okay. Just when he was here, it was echoing. Now it's okay. So God's grace, go to Romans chapter 11, verse 26. Romans chapter 11, verse 26. And so Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away on righteousness from Jacob. Okay. 
And then Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And then in chapter 13 of in verse 1 and 9 of Zechariah. In that day shall there be a fountain open to the house of David, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for the sin and for their uncleanness. And I will bring the third part through the fire. Remember, two-thirds are destroyed. Well, one-third of the part of Israel is going to go through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. And they shall call on my name and I will hear them. And I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. And then hey, Jeremiah, Brother John. yes, Brother John, yeah. Yes. Uh, what reference are you? What what portion are you reading? You know, the the men may not be able to get there. You kind of give them time to get their Bibles. We want them to follow which scripture? That was Zechariah twelve verse ten, and then Zechariah chapter thirteen verse one and nine. Okay. So at least Thank write you. that down. Yes, uh, Wilson and Mrs. Aruna are going to the passages. I see that. Then let's go to Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So that... There's going to be some that will be saved out of it. And then Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of Israel. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was even that time. The time of thy people shall be delivered. Every one written in the book. So those so what that is, are... What uh, Brother John, so what these these passages now that you're giving, uh, th what is this in reference to? The grace of the salvation of Israel. Okay. And so that time of Jacob's time of trouble. That during the tribulation, there'll be Israel be some of is a remnant of Israel be saved during the second half of the tribulation. Okay, That'll so that's, the that's what the focus here is. Okay. Yeah, we're yeah we're at the second half of the tribulation, talking about now that Israel. Oh, okay. Two, I'm two, I'm catching two, you in the middle. Okay, that I didn't. Right, two, uh, that's why I was. That's why I was asking. Sorry. Right. Two, no, no, that's a good missed. review. Two thirds of Israel, since we covered a lot of ground, that's a perfect review. Two thirds of Israel is destroyed in the tribulation, the first half. Now, in the second half of the tribulation, one third has a possibility of being saved because God said that one third will be delivered. So God's chastening hand will accomplish his purpose as he pours out a spirit of supplication, grace upon his people. And they will turn to God through individual repentance and will be born again as a new nation of regenerated citizens. And so all Israel shall be saved is what it says in the scripture. At the climatic close of the great day of God's wrath, the Lord will descend on the Mount of Olives, rip it in half. Rip it in half. Israel will flee from the onslaught of Antichrist armies through the rift created that was created when they broke the covenant, when they no longer could do worship. The third part of the nation of Israel, which God will bring through the fires of persecution, will look upon the Messiah and recognize that it was he whom they pierced. And they will call on his name and be gloriously saved. God will once again declare of Israel, my people. And they will what is the reference? Fire. John, John, what's the reference for that? Is that Zechariah 14? Yahweh is our God. Uh, I don't have that particular one written down. Yeah, where they look on him that was pierced. What's the reference for that? I think it's Zechariah 15, but I don't have it written down here. Zechariah 14. 14. It's either 14. All right, 14. 12 or 14, you got it? right. 14. Oh, I have it right here. Zechariah 12, 10. And they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. 
I have it right at the top of the page. Zechariah 12 10. So that's very important. And that's Zechariah when, 12, that's, 10. When, that's when the uh, Mount of Olives is going to be uh, when he, the Mount is going to be split in two, right? Yeah, ripped right in half. Mount Olives. So and it's a place where he went. Yeah, a, new, a new river, the river coming out of there, that new, the new, some new, new water or something, right? Yes. It's called the river of salvation, but not in a sense of he could dip in it for salvation. It's called because of the fact that this is where God has, has brought salvation. So God's grace and salvation of the nations is last of all. We had God's grace with the nation of Israel and their salvation. And then last of all, God's grace and the salvation of nations. And Zep Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 9. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 9. So you got Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. For Please then, read that. Read that scripture. I, uh, for then I will give to the people purified lips that all of them may mm -hmm. call on the name of the Lord to serve him shoulder to shoulder. Mm -hmm. And then the New Testament, Matthew 25, verse 32 to 34, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on a with his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10 and verse 14. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10 and verse 14. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds, and peoples and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb. Mm -hmm. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So the Amen. midpoint of the tribulation. So the midpoint of the tribulation period, Antichrist will have reached the pinnacle of his power and demand worldwide worship of himself. The heart of church will have been destroyed and virtually all commerce will be controlled by the Antichrist. All who refuse to worship the beast and receive his mark will be targeted by Antichrist and Martina. It's not about us. We won't be there. We'll be raptured, as we said much earlier. The majority of believers will pay their faith with their lives. The ones that believe during the second half of the tribulation are going to pay with their lives. It appears that the majority of them will be Gentile believers. There will be a great multitude of them from all nations and kindreds and people and tongues who will stand before the throne having come out of the great tribulation. In addition, now these are, the, Brother John, excuse me, these, uh, these people that you're talking about in Revelation 7, uh, are these the people that uh, probably are going to be saved during the tribulation period, the Jews or just anybody, I guess, that's going to get saved during the tribulation that uh, uh, as a result of the preaching of those 144,000 Jewish yes. evangelists. Yeah. So first all of Israel, and then we we're talking, we talked about a moment ago. Now we're talking about the nations that, that hear the word of God and are saved. So back to Zephaniah 3 9, it says, of purified lips, the word of the people. Not only will the remnant of Israel be saved, but God will pour out his saving grace on nations, and a great multitude will turn to Christ and be gloriously saved. The sheep nations will come before the Lord and hear these gorgeous words Come, you are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the word, world. So let's make our conclusion now. The judgment of God poured out through the tribulation period demonstrates his absolute pleasure, displeasure with sin and unbelief. All that wrath that's poured out, poured out during the tribulation shows the extent of God's hatred towards sin. 
God calls people out of darkness to be a people of his own possession, to be a holy people who keep his statutes and delight to do his pleasure. Now, what about us? And what do you take pleasure? The treasures, the pleasures of this world, or the accomplishment of God's mission for his people? Today, will you say with the psalmist in Psalm 86, verse 10 to 13, Psalm 86, verse 10 to 13, we'll close with, for thou art great and dost wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me. And thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. So today we praise and thank the Lord for delivering us. And we pray for him to deliver people to himself as we have relatives and friends and people that we've dealt with that still yet need to be saved. They won't be during the tribulation period. The rapture will come. We will be caught up. Rapturo will be caught up to be meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. But there'll be people born during the tribulation. There will be people that will live during the tribulation. There'll be people suffering during the tribulation and will hear the word of God and be saved. And it will be some that will be Israel and some that will be from the nations. Many, it says, of people and kindreds and tongues and nations. So that's from India and from Brazil and from Argentina and from Kenya and from Mananao, Philippines, and from little places that we don't even know about. There'll be people that believe because they will hear the word of God through Christ himself and through the 144,000. So may we be faithful until he comes or calls. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, our gracious, loving Lord, we thank you that, that you deliver your people. That through every tongue and people and nation, there will be a people that, that not rejecting you, not blaspheming you, not continuing their sin, but accept what Christ has done, his bloodshed, death on the cross, his suffering for us, in our behalf, in our stead, in our place. Thank you that all we like sheep have gone astray, but you've laid on him the iniquity of us all, and you were pleased to bruise him, and you knew that, we know that he's a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and we hid as ourselves from him. We esteemed him not, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Thank Man. you, Lord. For this great salvation that we study about today, may we tell others about it. May we send others to tell about it. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen.